to our second conversation for today. This is another very important one as we put into perspective the latest statistics coming out of the Statistical Institute of Belize. And they presented a lot of data yesterday, but today we're just diving into two aspects. We're looking at what the latest poverty indicators are saying and unemployment indicators. We have with us this morning the Acting Director General, Diana Castillo Trejo. We have Statistician One uh, for Census Surveys and Administrative Statistics, Kerwin Arthurs. And we have Wendy Benavides, who is the Statistician Two for Census Surveys and Administrative Statistics. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. OK. So as I mentioned before, I know that uh, the data presented yesterday, there was a lot to, to be able to break down. Um, and we're happy to have the opportunity to kind of explore uh, the, the information behind the data. Let's talk about what the, the latest releases are. Um, and we'll start with the labor force survey. Uh, so, so who wants to kind of give the background on the collection of this information? OK, I, I'll just start. Okay. Um, so this is a household survey where we sampled 3,000 households across the country. Mm -hmm. It is representative of both urban and rural areas. Um, it was done similar to the September round mm -hmm. uh, over the phone primarily. And then whoever we did not capture over the phone was visited in the field. Mm -hmm. Right. So we see um, a very good response rate. Um, we ended up with an 11.2% unemployment rate. We have majority of women um, who are more likely to be unemployed compared to males. And um, because of the different, because of the differences in the, in the definitions that were revised since the September 2020 round, um, it, there we find it very. Um, there is a limited comparability to to the previous April rounds of the labor force survey. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a part of what we we wanted to talk about. Um, so when you talk about what the definition of employed is, let's get that one clear. Who is considered an employed person? Uh, someone who's unemployed is is someone who is first without work. Um, who is also available to work and is looking for work. Mm -hmm. So the, the type of work isn't a factor here. So they could be looking for employment over the weekend only or a part-time job. Okay. As well as full as full time jobs. And if someone works one hour a week, they're considered employed. Yes, as long as they're working at least one hour for that reference week, they would be considered as employed. Okay. And underemployment, what, what's the definition for that? The persons who are underemployed are a subset of those who are employed. Mm -hmm. They're also working and they are working, but they're working less than 35 hours per week and they are also available to work more hours than usual. All right. So that those are key information to get out early. And let's let's look at how uh, what has changed most signif significantly from September to now. Um, we saw some we saw some uh, increase in the number of employed persons, um, about roughly almost sixteen thousand more persons compared to the September round. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit uh, less cases um, of, of, of persons who are not working due to the, due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and we also saw uh, an informal, in the informal, those who are informally uh, employed, at 32%. OK. I, I want to dive into to one aspect uh, that came out yesterday. Uh, Diana, maybe you want to you wanna chime in on this, because I know you've pointed it out as an area of concern. Women, uh, the, the rate of unemployment for women is double that of men. 
Yeah, and um, this has nothing to do with any changes that we have made with the concepts and the classifications and definitions. This is just a trend that we have consistently observed round after round. Women are unemployed at generally twice the rate that men are unemployed. Um, and it's something I think that as we look at the level of participation in the labor force, if women are not participating, if they're not productive in the labor force, um, there is a lot of unused potential um, that we would, I would think we would want to bring into the labor force and to try and utilize. So that has been something consistent. Women participate at a lower rate than men. Um, women are more likely to be unemployed regardless of their level of education. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, looking at um, perhaps the, the industries where persons are most employed in, in our labor force or, you know, the structure of our economy, it may very well have to do with just the types of jobs that are available. Um, we find that whenever there is any kind of growth in the services sector, there are a lot of gains in terms of jobs for women. When there is growth in things like um, agriculture, construction, other sectors where you find more males employed than females, yeah. um, you know, the, the gains are almost always completely in terms of males and there's this huge gap between males and females in terms of how they participate in the labor force yeah so this is this has always been and i, I picked up on it just because i know we've talked about it before pre-covid eras um that this continues to be an area of concern let's let's dive now into um the the unemployment due to covid in september um, you ensured that a part of your assessment for the labor force survey would um, allow for an indication as to whether unemployment was due to COVID or if it, were other, it was due to something else. So let's talk about the COVID-related unemployment. Where are we now? Um, at this time, we have about 19,400 persons who are not working. Whether they are looking or not looking for work, they are not working. And these persons reported that they had lost their jobs due to COVID. These persons have been without work, not working for uh, about, well, for more than a year, for thir 13 months on average. So these persons are, are have been without work for the long term. Um, it's a decrease compared to what we saw in September. In September, we saw 34,000 people. So that is an indication that persons perhaps are starting to find work. So, you know, these 19,000 persons, as I said, whether they're looking or not looking for work, they lost their jobs due to COVID. So this is an indication that we probably have persons who have been able to find employment. I think that the next thing that needs to be looked at, however, is the type of employment that these people are finding. If you look, as Wendy mentioned, there is a high rate of informality in our labor force or in our employed labor force um, and informal jobs we have found on average um, persons who are employed in informal jobs make about half of what the rest of the labor force or the rest of the employed population makes about um, their 600. hours are, right yeah. their hours are shorter they make they make less income and um when we start looking at the the poverty study um you know the level of income at least in terms of monetary poverty is directly related to persons and their families likelihood of falling into poverty so it is something that needs to be looked at not just the fact that jobs are being gained but also what types of jobs and how um, how formal or, or informal they are or what type of incomes um, they're providing for our people just just so we have some clarity here what do you consider to be informal work I mean as as we uh, publish the report um, informal would be persons who they're working, but they are not registered with Social Security as an employee. Um, or if they are self-employed, they have a little business, they're running out of their home, for example, they're not registered with the company's registry. So um, that's the criteria that we use for informal. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about one of the areas that I'm sure uh, starting today people will, will start to question. There was a revision of the definitions of uh, unemployment and employment. We talked about what they are today. What you've done is that you used your uh, indicators to kind of paint the picture of what unemployment would have been like 
had you kept the original definitions. So if you use the last definition, there are about 39, there are 39,000 people unemployed. But with the current definitions, it's only 20,000. Explain to me what happened to the other 19,000. Where are they lost in the numbers? So you would basically see those persons, because they didn't uh, fulfill that criteria of looking for work, they would have fallen in the potential labor force. So you see those persons who are not uh, looking for work during that reference period, but they were available to work. So they have an interest in working, yet for some reason, for some barrier, they weren't looking for work. Okay. So those would have been classified as unemployed in previous studies, but now we have a stricter definition of the unemployed um, for them to so they have satisfy to, those, those two criteria. They have to report, like when they're doing the survey, that they are looking for a job or they yes. want to get a job. They were either um, searching on a, news, on, on a newspaper or online or asking their friends, relatives, asking anyone. Okay. It doesn't mean that they physically have to be um, job hunting. In a, in, on a job interview. Yeah. So even if you use the previous definitions or the current definitions, there has been a reduction in unemployment. Um, a smaller margin with the new definition, a larger margin with the older definition. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. And for underemployment? For underemployment there, we see, yes, because of the revision of the definition as well, you only used to capture those persons who are, who are working less than 35 hours. Mm -hmm. And now we're capturing those who are also fulfill that criteria and also are wanting and available to work additional hours. Okay. So let's... The, the average monthly salary was something, I think, Dana, that you were talking about, that in the informal trade, um, they're making about half of what the average monthly salary is um, for formal work, which is about $1,300. Um, there it is, yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, so you find people who are working in, the, in informal jobs, almost um, half of it, they're, they're getting $679 on average, versus someone who is working in, 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 formal, in formal employment, um, earning at around $1,300. Okay. So let's talk about some of the other standout facts that came from this latest uh, unemployment uh, labor force survey, I'm sorry. Uh, the young people, uh, the situation of, of youths is also 21% um, of youths in the labor force are unemployed. Yes, that's a, that's a, a trend that, that has been um, seen in, in previous rounds of this, of this study as well. Uh, at around, uh, they have an, a, a level of unemployment at around 20, 21%. And, and that's basically the same group that we have been seeing. Okay. And the un underemployment average uh, work per week, is that 17 hours that we see? So, yes, we see on average persons uh, on a given week, they are working at around 17 hours versus someone who would be working yeah. 35 hours a week. All right, so I'm, I'm going to shift gears, and, and there's some, I know there are other uh, st stats that we want to cover, but I want to bring Kerwin into the conversation as well. And Kerwin, I know uh, you're going to break down for us what is also equally important. It's looking at uh, the poverty analysis, the main findings so far. So Kerwin, put it into perspective. How is this data ga gathered? Good morning. Good morning. Um, again. Yeah, um, this this uh, 2018 2018 poverty study um, was a bit unique in uh, in, in its nature. Uh, this uh, unlike the labor force survey, which was um, conducted within the same time period, uh, 
in terms of the data collection and then the analysis done. And uh, this one was uh, looking back. So uh, the, 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 the idea that, um, or the way that this whole project came about was um, in, uh, in 2019, we were supposed to do a country poverty assessment, which is a big uh, holistic framework that looks at uh, poverty at, uh, at different levels or at different, um, uh, in different aspects. Um, however, that, uh, that CPA was, um, was not done due to financial reasons, as, as, as Ms. Diana mentioned yesterday at the press conference, um, it's very costly to do. Um, so what, what we did um, as an interim uh, measure is that we uh, decided to see if we have any available um, data that could be used um, to, to, to update the poverty lines and, and do our yeah. um, and get our updated poverty indicators. Yes. Um, so, so that's one of the main difference between this this study and, and, and for example, the, the, the LFS, the labor force survey. Um, so that's just a bit of a background. So okay. we, we, we had some support. Uh, we, we have a good partnership with Statistics Canada through the project for uh, regional advancement of statistics in the Caribbean or PRAS. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's like a capacity building project where uh, you know, the Statistics um, Institute of Canada or Statistics Canada offers um, training and, 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 and assistance to, to help us to build capacity in country in, in our institute. Yeah. So this program benefited from that partnership um, and we got the oversight and, and all the support we needed um, to use the 2018, which was the latest um, uh, available data we had from a survey uh, that we did that was called the Household Budget Survey. Yes. Um, and that is the basis for everything that was done. Can I just get a, a an in, because I don't want people to, I want us to put it into perspective. The, if we're in 2021, this data is not reflective of this year's situation. It's of the situation in 2018. Yes, that's correct. That, okay. um, as Carmen mentioned, this data pertains to 2018 into 2019. Okay. It was collected for a different purpose, but um, we found that it could be used for the purpose of estimating poverty in the absence of an actual poverty survey. Um, but yes, uh, one of the things that is important to point out is that this pertains to 2018. Um, this would give us a picture, and, and to be clear, it's the most updated picture that we have of poverty just prior to COVID-19. Yeah, It's a first step in yes. assessing how we have been affected, for example, by the pandemic. So we need to know where we were just prior yes, um, so that we can measure where we are now at this point in time and um, really take a look at how badly or how, you know, to what extent we have been affected um, by the pandemic as it relates to poverty and well-being. So in the pre-COVID era, based on the data uh, that you have, poverty uh, went up. The last indicator I think we had was about 40%, 41%. Yes, that's correct. And right. now, pre-COVID, before we all suffered the pandemic, we were at 52. Over half of the population in the country is poor. Yes, that's correct. Or, or about 201,616 um, 201, individuals. Yeah. What's the classification or definition for poor or poverty? Okay, so for um, for this for this study and, and similar and, and I should mention again and we've been mentioning it yeah. in all of the releases and everything that we produce regarding this um, study, yeah. um, the same methodology that was used in two thousand and nine um, in the country poverty assessment at that time was used for this two thousand and eighteen poverty study, um, and this this methodology uses the cost of basic needs. Um, so in, in, in a nutshell, what, what is done is we, um, there's a method that we use a process that we follow to try and estimate what the cost of, um, the cost of survival for a day for an individual would be, um, the basic cost, inc including the cost of food and, you know, the basic stuff you need for survival, like food, um, shelter and clothing. And, um, we, we take that, uh, we take that, that cost and annualize it. Um, to, to get the annual cost for the year, and then we compare um, we compare a household's uh, expenditure, how much they spend annually, um, to to that amount. And once the once the amount that uh, the expenditure is less than 
than the cost of, of, of basic needs for survival for a day. Um, then that uh, that household and the individuals in that household are being classified or are then are then classified as being poor. Okay. And then you go even further into the classification. You have people who are considered poor, people who are or people whose status is indigent, and then you also have those who are vulnerable. Let's uh, let's break those down. Okay. So so building on the same um, definition that, that I mentioned just now. Um, where we have uh, uh, a, cost, uh, a basic cost for survival for one person, so it's a singular cost, and then we have a singular cost for, the, uh, for household expenditure for the year, and we compare them. Um, for, the, for the indigent, uh, these, 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 these um, households or individuals are uh, a, a segment of the, of the poor. So these are the critically poor, and um, these persons are those, when we compare them to so the cost of just food, the, the basic cost of food on a daily basis, these persons uh, were unable to meet that cost in terms of looking at their expenditure. Yeah. So um, that would be the definition for indigent. These are the really extremely poor that cannot even afford the daily cost of, of food. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the vulnerable to, to poverty is, is something very unique. And um, it's, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure if it, re it recently got done or started in 2009, but I know in 2009, it was done in 2018, we did it again. And it's important if you're looking at um, eliminating poverty or addressing poverty in the country, it gives, it gives you an idea of how many households, how many individuals are just too close to the, to, to the poverty line to, to, to end up falling into poverty because of um, you know, some economic shock or a natural disaster comes and you know, it pushes them right into, into poverty. So um, those are the three key definitions. Um, uh, that was used for this uh, study. So that, that vulnerable group is kind of the group where we always say, you know, you're one paycheck away um, from not being able to meet your needs. Yes, yes. Okay. Essentially, that's what it is. Now, the, the population uh, and, and indigent, um, the numbers are down from 2009, 14%, I think, to, to 9, 16% to 9%. Um, but the population that you have identified to be uh, classified, the highest number of indigent, is the elderly. Um, yes, that's correct. If we look at um, if we look at if we look at the uh, if we look at the population in terms of by age, um, we notice that um, the, the most affected those most affected by age in terms of indigents. Um, if we're talking about, in, well, let's start with, with, with poverty first. In terms yeah. of poverty, the poverty rate are, are the youth. So we see that those, um, those uh, children less than oh 18 gosh. years of age had the highest poverty rates. And, um, and the, 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 the youth, um, 14, years and 14 to 24 years, also had a significantly higher rate than, wow. than the, the older age ranges. Yeah. So the very young... And the very old. Uh, well, actually, the, the the very young are, are the ones that that, that experience the most um, the, the, the highest levels of poverty. And then, if we go on the flip side, the very old um, are the ones that um, experience the, the least level of poverty. Yeah. So I know it, it's a lot of data, and and so I wanna I wanna uh, pull out just particular um, aspects. And by all means, Kerwin, let me let me just open it up to you and to your team there. Uh, what stands out the most to you? I, I had been saying for a long time on the show, you know, it's a pity that we don't get to do a census because a part of it was going to provide this data. But now we have the poverty study. What stands out the most to you? Well, well to me, um, to me overall, when we look at the, when we look at the, the updated indicators, um, what stands out to me is that it's, it's very encouraging. Because one might look at the the significant increase in, in poverty, um, and not see uh, and not see within that also that we also had some movement from um, the the most critical or extreme yeah. levels of poverty or those in those conditions. Yeah. Uh, we reduce the number of those persons, right? Yeah. Um, so as you mentioned earlier, that that the the indigent rate, which are these persons 
um, was reduced or went from 16% to, to 9%, right? Yeah. So I think that, that, that might be missed when, when we just look at the poverty rate uh, significantly increasing from 41% to 52%. Yeah. But I think it's more encouraging to look on the other side that we're moving um, our population um, from those uh, most affected by poverty severely from out of those situations. So I think that's very encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for you, Diana? Um, I think that what what this study highlighted for me was that there is clearly the need for a lot more uh, work to be done on the area of understanding poverty in our country. I mean, some of the trends that we have seen here, for example, you know, um, poverty is highest in households that have children. Um, yet the trends that we have been seeing from one census to the next, and well, we will see if this holds in the following census, is that um, birth rates were falling and household sizes were falling. So, you know, that leads to the question, why is poverty still increasing if things like this um, are the factors that contribute to poverty? But I think it just highlights the fact that there is the need for a lot more work to be done um, for this to be studied more closely and not just in terms of monetary poverty, but in terms of poverty in various dimensions, uh, which is a piece of work that we hope to, to do later this year um, to actually produce some poverty statistics when we do the September labor force survey, um, looking not just at monetary poverty, but at poverty at the multidimensional level where we can look at um, the issue of poverty and well-being in a much more broad context and understand um, in, more, in more detail um, where poverty is coming from, who's affected, and in what ways they're affected. You, you, you mentioned something interesting. You said that uh, the birth rate is down, so, so there aren't as many um, families aren't growing the way that they used to. The, but there is a, a correlation um, between the size of the household, the number of people who live together, and poverty. Can you explain that one? Yeah, um, because this measure of poverty, it, it is it is income based, uh, so it's based on the household's ability to sustain a certain level of expenditure, which um, would be highly re related to the household income. The more children you have in the household, who obviously are not income earners, um, the more people you have that need to consume, but the less income you have to sustain that consumption. So um, by this measure, the bigger a household is, the fewer income earners they have, um, you know, it. it would be it's easy to make that connection they're more likely to be to fall into poverty um, because uh, their their level of income for the household has to be spread across more people um, and yes between 2000 and 2010 we did observe a decrease in birth rates and i can't say off the top of my head what it was the last time um, but we did see household sizes falling on average and even in our um, household surveys now when we estimate you know population and household size we are seeing falling household sizes so if that holds up in the the following census which is scheduled for next year um it really does you know beg the question well perhaps it's it's well obviously it's not just household size that yeah. affects this there are other factors um so you know where is it that we need to look in terms of um areas that have to be addressed in order to reduce poverty. Yeah. Like Kerwin said, there there obviously was um, gains made in terms of addressing poverty for the most critically poor. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, poverty in general is obviously still a very big issue. Yeah. There's, a, there's an agency that always talks about working with the poorest of the poor. I think that that's a, an, a, a way to describe um, when we say indigent people. But... Um, yeah, uh, you know, to know that there are less people living in, in, in such severe poverty, that definitely is a shining light. And thank you for, for pointing that out, Kerwin. Um, but the indicators that the poverty study also helps, and data always helps, in helping us to identify where greatest needs are and priority areas for focus. And so I want to take the time to talk about the breakdown by districts. Uh, where are we seeing uh, the greatest increases or, or uh, what are we seeing in the picture painted district by district? All right, so, so if we look at the poverty rates by district, um, we notice that um, 
for this uh, 2018 poverty study that um, the Toledo district again had um, the highest, um, were affected the most by poverty and had the highest poverty rate. Yeah. Um, and, and on the flip side to that, we had uh, Corozal um, having the lowest, um, the lowest poverty rate or being the least affected by poverty. Yeah. They had a um, reduction, we, right? They had a reduction, yes. Yeah. And the most significant change actually between 2009 and 2018 um, they had uh, a reduction from 56%, um, a poverty rate of 56% in 2009, uh, and it fell to 45% in 2018. Yeah. It's, it's always and, and difficult. This, and, this again, and I should mention that this again reflects what I was mentioning in terms of the encouraging yeah. uh, trend that we noticed. Uh, this was a direct reflection of um, uh, households and persons being moved out of the most critical and extreme and severe um, forms of uh, situations of poverty in the district and moving um, from out of that um, category into um, the, 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 uh, the general poor and maybe even perhaps um, out of poverty or to the vulnerable level. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I know that you, you collect kind of the data, but what inferences are we making based on this data? Why was Corozal able to uh, reduce poverty when uh, all other districts uh, increased? Do we know any early indicators or inferences we can make? Yes, yes. Um, um, like I mentioned, it, 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 it goes, um, goes back uh, to what I was mentioning in terms of the, the, uh, the transfers from um, the different levels of poverty. So we noticed that for Corozal, um, there, there, uh, there was a significant um, decrease in the number of um, critically, um, uh, or, or the indigent poor, the critically poor. Um, and, and, and these persons, um, uh, these persons were, were moved from that level okay. um, all the way out of poverty. Wow. Okay. And, and lastly, if you could talk about the income inequality, what that means and what our latest indicators are. Okay, so in terms of income inequality, what we use, the, in, the, in this, the index that we use is called the Gini index. Um, and it looks at um, the, uh, the, the level of inequality in terms of income in the country. Uh, and we noticed that in 2018, in the, the 2018 study, um, that that index uh, increased to 0 0.49 from 0 0.38 uh, that it was in 2009. Um, it might it might look like uh, some cause for concern uh, initially if you look at it, but um, when we compare it to what's uh, known internationally in, in terms of what's uh, in a, within an accept, uh, acceptable range, mm -hmm. we're we're still in 2018. We were still within. I would say a moderate level of uh, income inequality in the country. Um, but when we look at the, the year comparison 2009 to 2018, um, we are, we, we, there was significant change and we are inching closer to, to, to the most, um, to the highest levels of, of income inequality. So, so we're not at the, at the highest yeah. levels of income inequality at 2018, but we're Right, we're, we're close knocking on the door, so we have to pay we're attention. We're moving in the wrong direction. We should be going down. But just, just for a basic definition, what does that mean? Income inequality. Um, in, uh, well, the, the, the technical definition is, is not as useful as, <laughs> as um, doing comparisons as, as we did. Yeah. Um, but you give us the one we can understand. Um, Technically, what, what it's saying is that um, uh, it, it's telling us that uh, for uh, for the nine percent of the population controls um, all all of the income in the country. So so and and that's literally, literally what it what it means, right? So it's it's kind of difficult to to put it in a perspective that it's yeah. useful apart from the way that it's used here in terms of comparing yeah. to to other rates internationally. But it's it's actually telling you that. Um, uh, forty nine percent of the population controls all of the income and or owns all of the income in the country, which when you think when you think about it um intuitively it's it is not as as useful because we know that they for the for the fifty one percent uh, of the of the rest of the population would it's not uh it, it's not 
uh, it's not uh, practical to think that all of those persons have zero income. Yeah. You know, so that's what I was saying. The but it's just to kind of show the, 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 the weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a measure that's used that that we found interesting. Um, I, I want to give my, I want to get uh, the final question from uh, Diana. I know we we ran through time very quickly here, but Diana, looking at at the data today, especially with the the poverty study, which I hope we can dive deeper into, um, the question is, how much do you think? And and this is of course all speculation. These numbers are going to change significantly when we look at post-pandemic period. Would you agree? Um, I, I think it's reasonable to assume that, even in the absence of information. And um, we might have some early indications of it that if we're looking at poverty once more from a monetary um, perspective, yeah. um, the amount of persons who are employed, for example, informally and, and make that very low level of income on average, um, the 600 and something dollars is very close to the poverty line. So, you know, the more people we have inching towards those types of employment, um, I think it's reasonable to assume that we might see increases in poverty the next time that we do it. So, um, again, I, like I said, I think it speaks to the urgent need for further study um, to know exactly how far we might have inched past that 52%. Um, and start looking at who are the persons who are most affected, um, in what aspects or dimensions of poverty they are most affected, um, so that we as a country can begin to address that and bring people back into um, that category of, of not poor and being able to live just, you know, um, a life where they can sustain just their basic needs comfortably. Yeah. All right. And where can people access the information on the uh, latest releases? Um, our information is all published on our website, um, sib.org.bz. Um, all our releases are published there. There's Excel data that can be downloaded. Um, and if anyone would like more detailed information, our data dissemination department can be contacted. Their contact information is on the website as well. Um, and they are able to provide more detailed information or customized tables or anything that might be of interest. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. I, I mean, this is one of those uh, scenarios where I say we barely scratched the surface, and it really means we barely scratched the surface. There's a wealth of information uh, that you've released uh, all at once, and, and today I think we just kind of set the backdrop as to why people should go check it out. Um, so I hope people look at these numbers and try to understand more about what's happening or where we are um, in the status in the country. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, too. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to be getting all the details about the first annual Belize Taiwan Academic Conference. So please.